Aloha mai kako. You are watching Hawaii Political Reporter. Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Political Reporter. Thanks for watching. Tonight, the real danger of CISPA, using corporations to spy on you, and a very important program that terrorists have been identified, explains and identifies false flag attacks and who benefits from them. Next week, in-depth coverage of the Boston attack. On Thursday, April 18, 2013, while everyone was distracted by the Boston bombing case, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, a.k.a. CISPA, passed the House with 288 votes for and 127 votes against it. Typical sneaky politician tactic. They hoped you wouldn't notice. So what is CISPA and why should you care? How is it dangerous? First thing we should do is clear up one misconception. CISPA is not a framework designed to allow the government to easily take down websites like SOPA was. In fact, it doesn't deal with censorship at all. Instead, it focuses on the sharing of information between the US government and private companies. Now there are two components to this information sharing. The first part isn't very controversial. It makes it easier for the government to share information related to cyber threats with IT companies. But it's the second component of this law that's troublesome, because it creates provisions to allow private companies such as Google, Facebook, or your internet provider to send your personal information to the U.S. government at any time without a warrant. Companies sharing this information could do so without ever notifying you, and they would be completely shielded from any legal recourse. Information shared in this way would be exempt from the Freedom of Information Act, meaning you would have no way of finding out whether your data had been given to the government at all. Now, while this is supposedly intended to help protect networks from attacks from China, it should be clear that what the U.S. government really wants is to use private companies to gather even more information about people like you. Now, of course, there's the typical defense that people put up, which is that if you aren't doing anything wrong, you have nothing to hide. But this ignores the fact that many of these IT companies are not politically neutral. We've seen this even in the past few weeks as Facebook has blocked numerous sites which were discussing the Boston bombing cover-up. Consider the danger of having a company employee that sees some controversial content that you've posted on Facebook or elsewhere be given the power to simply flag you and have your data sent to the authorities. In the context of the ever more blatant government corruption and criminality, this is extremely dangerous, and it should be viewed as a direct threat to whistleblowers and the alternative media. That this information gathering would be politically driven isn't just speculation. On February 5th of 2013, the White House announced plans to establish a new interagency working group to counter online radicalization. The working group will be headed by the White House National Security Staff. Quentin Wiktorowicz, the Senior Director for Community Partnerships and the National Security Staff, made the following statement. Violent extremist groups like Al-Qaeda, its affiliates and adherents, violent supremacist groups, and violent sovereign citizens are leveraging online tools and resources to propagate messages of violence and division. Now obviously they're using these derogatory terms to obscure the fact that they're going to be targeting political activists. Notice that they say messages of violence and division. Division being the operative term here, because you can accuse anyone who's speaking out against the government as propagating messages of division. In spite of the obvious privacy issues in this bill, CISPA's House sponsor, Republican Mike Rogers, recently indicated that anyone who shared these concerns is simply childish. And he compared detractors to a 14-year-old tweeter in the basement. He then acted shocked when the internet responded by posting his address and other personal information online. What did you expect, Mikey? You just passed the law to give away our information. Listen, there's no point trying to petition these politicians nicely. Begging at their feet is weak and unproductive. What those who voted for this law need to hear is that their vote is going to be remembered, along with their names, photos, and home addresses. They need to understand that their actions are treason. And not just figuratively, it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. These politicians think that they can operate with impunity? Well, then make them understand that you will be holding them personally responsible, and that they had better do everything in their power to make sure their buddies in the Senate don't let this pass. April 15th, 2013 will be a day that lives in infamy. People across America and indeed around the world watched in horror as explosions ripped through quiet city streets, the result of bombs set by terrorists as yet unidentified. The blast wave tore apart the lives of all they touched and the people of the world remained on the edge of their collective seat, transfixed by their television sets, waiting for further details about this terrorist atrocity. It has been a violent day in Iraq. Authorities now say more than 40 people were killed in a string of bombings across the country. More than 250 were wounded. Two of the blasts struck a checkpoint outside Baghdad airport. The explosions there were among more than 30 attacks that took place from northern Iraq to the south. No one's claimed responsibility for the violence, but it comes as Iraqis prepare to vote in provincial elections. For more on these attacks, now, hold on a minute. So those bombings, which tore through crowded urban centers uh, this past Monday in Iraq, killing now a confirmed 55 people, aren't the bombs that the American mainstream media have been absolutely fixated on in their nonstop 24-7 news cycle for the past week? 
Uh, no, of course not. What we are talking about when we talk about the bombing that took place on Monday, of course we're talking about the Boston Marathon bombing, which killed three people. Which, of course, every death on this planet is a, a tragedy, and we don't want it to occur, and we don't want innocent uh, people, especially eight-year-old boys or anyone else, to be torn apart, literally, by blasts planted by cowards. But uh, th for some reason, there are certain violent terrorist explosion incidents that garner a lot of attention and uh, others that are mentioned in passing, if at all, in the media uh, blogosphere. And, and why is that? Why do certain events get more attention than others? Well, of course, it is a lamentable, perhaps, but oft-observed part of human psychology that we are hardwired to care more about those people that are within our, our backyard or our sphere of activity, however that is broadly defined. So one could certainly make the argument that the, the bombings in the Boston Marathon incident certainly falls more within the American population's quote-unquote monkey sphere, as it's been termed, than the blasts occurring halfway across the planet. So by that logic, if there was another blast to be that was even more deadly, in fact five times more deadly, and much, much bigger, leveling houses and, and uh, tearing carnage through another part of the United States within the same week as the Boston Marathon bombing, surely that blast would warrant the non-stop 24-7 incessant news coverage trying to drill down to the bottom of what occurred and prevent it from ever happening again, right? Of our breaking news this hour, two people are confirmed dead and 200 injured in a blast that has ripped through a fertilizer plant in the U.S. state of Texas. Local residents have been advised to evacuate from the area in the town of West, just north of Waco. Firefighters, ambulances and helicopter support are at the scene. This is the moment of the second blast which caused that devastating damage. Eyewitnesses say fire took out apartment complexes nearby, schools and houses, uh, some of which have collapsed. People are still trapped in some of those houses and uh, the rescue teams are trying to get to them as we speak. Well, in addition... Hmm. Well, now things are getting complicated because that seems at least more of a like and like comparison that we could use to question the motivations of the news media and the political sphere for concentrating so fixatedly on the Boston Marathon bombing. In this case, at any rate, it's a blast that occurred in America that killed uh, 15 people in this case and uh, injured hundreds more and leveled houses it was quite a significant event by any standards and certainly in a side-by-side com -side comparison with the Boston Marathon bombing, one would say that it would warrant five times the coverage, wouldn't one? Well, of course, that's not how it works either. And that brings up the question of why certain events and certain incidents are given this non-stop fixated attention as the biggest news story in the world by outlets that are promoting a certain agenda. What is that agenda? Why are certain incidents given this type of coverage? I'm sure for the vast majority of my listeners and viewers, this should be quite apparent by now that in fact, these types of incidents like the Boston Marathon bombing are fixated on because they play into an overall political paradigm, an overall idea of spreading fear, an overall agenda that can be forwarded at the political level. The Boston Marathon bombing can be used to argue, for example, for teams of roving TSA Viper teams on the streets of America and pat downs and uh, bomb sniffing dogs at all public events and uh, TSA scanners at the shopping malls and whatever else may or may not come of events like these. But a fertilizer bl facility blowing up in West Texas simply does not warrant that type of political action and thus is not going to be promoted as heavily as an important news event that we should all dedicate our attention to. Now, this point was made quite brilliantly earlier this week by Adam Kokesh of AdamVersusTheMan.com. What this really reveals, when you don't, you, you, you don't hear about the half a million dead in Iraq before the, the latest invasion, who died, children who died of starvation and, and lack of access to adequate medical supplies, slow, painful deaths. No, you don't see that. Or hear about the 1.4 million that have died in Iraq since the invasion. You know, 5% of the population. No, 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 no. We have to shield you, citizens of the empire, from that so that you can be easily manipulated and taken advantage of by your government. You are programmed to feel 
what you are told to feel. And there's a difference here. Yes, the accident versus the attack. And it reveals that Americans who will shrug off the fertilizer plant explosion, say, oh, it's just an accident. It represents a greater threat to your life, an industrial accident. And in this case, if you want to put a scale on it, 15 people at least already died in Texas, three in Boston. You would think there would be some sensible proportion response. Why the disproportion? Because you are programmed to feel what you are told to feel. Because it makes you easier to manipulate. I think Adam is right to put the onus as he does on the viewers and the audience of this media uh, equally as much as the media itself for being culpable for forwarding this fear agenda of fixating on these terrorist incidents because they are quite sensational and they do grab attention and they do have these inbuilt storylines which keep people on the edge of their seat. Oh, what, what, has the bomb been identified? What kind of bomb was it? Has, has any person of interest been identified? Have they been arrested? What's the latest on the investigation? These details keep the viewers on the edge of their seats, keep them transfixed to their television sets and keeps the storyline going, keeps it part of the national conversation and puts it front and center in people's minds that this is something we have to concentrate on. This is something we have to get to the bottom of because it is vitally important to your life. Whereas, of course, if we step back for even a moment and examine the, the facts as they are, we see that absolutely you are much more likely to die in as a result of a bee sting, for example, than in a terrorist blast in the United States. But still, it's the sensation, it's the shock value, and it grabs people who aren't using their critical fa fa uh, faculties to examine the actual risks involved and the actual merit of the intense fixation that the American public has given to this issue. But let's step back for a moment and examine what terrorism is and how it is used in these contexts. Because it's important if we're going to fixate on terrorism as we do, or as the media would like us to, it's important to have the ground work laid. We have to have a definition for what is terrorism and how do we identify it when we see it. Well, that definition comes, there are many different definitions we could use, but why don't we take it straight from the horse's mouth? On the FBI website, they offer their own definition of terrorism, where they write in a public uh, announcement about terrorism, quote, There is no single universally accepted definition of terrorism. Terrorism is defined in the Code of Federal Regulations as the unlawful use of force and violence against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof in furtherance of political or social objectives." End quote. Well, then, at the very least, by a definition like that one, what does that make the news media which fixates and propagates this information about these terrorist incidents and shoves it down the public's throats absolutely ad nauseum 24-7 to hype up these events, in order to bring about the types of national conversations about, for example, putting troops on the street or allowing uh, full body searches uh, to, to board public transit or putting TSA scanners in shopping malls or wherever else this conversation may eventually lead, what does that make the news media? Does that make them people who are aiding and abetting terrorists? Well, I think there's certainly that case to be made, and if by that definition they are aiding and abetting terrorists, then wouldn't they fall into Section 1044 of the uh, NDAA 2012? Wouldn't they be subject to the punishments meted out under that particular section of that bill? Well, theoretically they would in any system that was not built on the fundamental hypocrisy that the current system so obviously is. Obviously terrorism is meant to be that boogeyman watchword which and allows and justifies any number of ills. But never, never can people actually look at where the political and social coercion is coming from. Is it coming from Al-Qaeda or whatever shadowy groups come along that might get blamed for attacks like this? Or is it coming from the media which hypes up and shoves these terrorist incidents down the public's throat until they, the public start to believe that this truly is the most significant thing happening in their country. Well, obviously, I think that the answer is that the terrorists are the ones in the positions of power to affect political change 
on the back of incidents like these. And regardless of where or who particularly planted the bomb, the terrorist uh, part of this act is the, the, the political and social coercion that comes along with it. And that isn't coming from whatever group might have perpetrated this that never took uh, responsibility, for example, for the Boston Marathon bombing. It's coming from the people in government who are going to come along and propose the solutions of putting more troops on the street or whatever the solutions might be to events like this one and whatever other ones come up in the future. So this is a point that has probably been made many times, but I think it does bear repeating that the terrorists are the ones that are trying to terrorize you and change your mindset. News. In our top story this week, a series of comments from prominent political operatives and media personalities praising the political utility of large-scale terror attacks are drawing widespread condemnation. In one of the latest examples, former Clinton official and Obama supporter Rob Shapiro was quoted in the Financial Times this week, seemingly hoping for a new spectacular terror event to revive the public's waning belief in the Obama administration. The bottom line here is that Americans don't believe in President Obama's leadership, he was quoted as saying. He has to find some way between now and November of demonstrating that he is a leader who can command confidence and, short of a 9-11 event or an Oklahoma City bombing, I can't think of how he could do that. The comment, which was swiftly and roundly condemned by political commentators, came as no surprise to those who have noted similar rhetoric from those on both the left and the right, who realize that the current political paradigm is constructed on the myth of a pervasive, monolithic, and ruthless terrorist conspiracy. In 2005, a confidential GOP memo was le leaked stressing the need for a devastating terror attack to validate the war on terror and unite the country in shock and sorrow. These exact sentiments were echoed in 2007 by Dennis Milligan, who expressed the need for another 9-11 to prove war on terror naysayers wrong in his first interview as Arkansas Republican Party chairman. The idea surfaced again later in 2007 when columnist Stu Baikowski wrote an op-ed in the Philadelphia Daily News entitled, To Save America, We Need Another 9-11. Baikowski defended his remarks on Fox News and was aided in that defense by John Gibson. 9-11 united the country and it remained united and we were all on the same team for at least a year or two. Now that comes from a Sunday Update episode that was created back in July of 2010. So these ideas have certainly been identified for a long time that in fact the terrorists are the ones that are terrorizing you with incidents like these in order to try to change your perceptions of social and political issues and trying to prod you along in the direction of giving up your rights and freedoms because it is certainly true that terrorists hate you for your freedoms. Just the question is, who are the terrorists? Well, obviously, it is the people in the positions of power who are able to direct society and prod them along in one direction by, at the very least, portraying and endlessly reporting on events like these, throwing out completely the scale of perspective on how, uh, how much of a risk incidents like these really are, regardless of even who is the one physically planting the bombs. But there is an upside to this, and that is the upside that people really are breaking through that wall of conditioning and beginning to question who really does benefit from these acts of terrorism and who really does benefit, for example, from supporting terrorists like Jundula in Iran or whether that be uh, the, the jihadis in Syria. Who, who really benefits from calling those people valiant freedom fighters and then demonizing anything that happens in the United States like political dissent as forms of terrorism? Clearly, it is the people in the positions of power and as a result of that, these are the people who should be questioned most closely in the wake of every large-scale terror attack because they are the ones that stand to benefit from this. Now, this is an idea that for a long time has been very difficult to break through to the general public. When attempting to describe the idea of false flag terrorism, that is terrorism perpetrated by one, uh, one agency, one government, one, one, set, uh, one group of individuals to blame on another, it's, it's a difficult concept to wrap your mind around, so that often when the, these ideas have been presented in the past, people have been met with blank stares and questions such as, but why would the government attack itself? Well, that is no longer a question that comes up 
quite as frequently as it used to, and we are starting to see that breakthrough into the mainstream paradigm. Now, this is an important point of what we're talking about today, so let's take a look at an article that was posted on Global Research earlier this week under the headline, Boston Marathon Bombings, False Flag Meme Infiltrating Mainstream Media Discourse. And this article reads in part, quote, After the Boston bombings of April 16, 2013, even the corporate monopoly media could no longer ignore the possibility of a false flag attack. Yahoo News asked who's behind the Boston Marathon bombings and offered four theories. One, Islamic jihadists. Two, right-wing militia types. Three, the government. And four, a criminally insane lone wolf. Numbers one, two, and four, of course, are the usual suspects. But including three, the government, on the suspect list, is unprecedented for a mainstream news story reporting on a domestic terror incident. The false flag meme's growing prominence was underlined at Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick's press conference after the bombings. The first question for Governor Patrick came from InfoWars correspondent Dan Bedondi, who asked whether the bombings were a false flag staged event to take away our civil liberties. Patrick, of course, answered no. Even the Atlantic Monthly, a neocon light magazine associated with names like Goldberg and Hitchens, felt compelled to publish a story headlined, What is a false flag attack and what does Boston have to do with this? Amazingly, the Atlantic article stated that yes, there is historical precedent for viewing the Boston bombing as a false flag event. The author, Philip Bump, even admitted, if the Boston attack had been a false flag attack, Governor Patrick would have responded no anyway. We should not dismiss these types of victories when they come, because it does show that we are on a trajectory in which we are making a difference, in which the people truly are waking up to what is really going on, and that cannot be taken uh, seriously enough. And on that note, it is, I think, no coincidence that in the immediate wake of the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, a video of mine that has been lying dormant for the past three years suddenly took off. And it was the video, When False Flags Don't Fly, which of course is available from youtube.com slash Corbett Report, but has also been mirrored and re-mirrored by multiple accounts across YouTube. And some of those mirrors ended up getting tens of thousands of views. And in aggregate, this video has been seen by another 100,000 people in the various different places that it's been posted over the past week. And a lot of people who are viewing the video were surprised to see that it dates back to 2010. What, you mean people have known about this type of thing for years? People have been talking about this for a long time? Yes, more and more people are just now discovering the things that we've been talking about for years, and this is a good thing. So let's continue to press this and make these types of statements viral so that people understand the history of false flag terrorism. So without further ado, let's represent to the audience out there that might not be familiar with it my 2010 video, When False Flags Don't Fly. Those who have studied history know that nothing invigorates and empowers an authoritarian regime more than a spectacular act of violence, some sudden and senseless loss of life that allows the autocrat to stand on the smoking rubble and identify himself as the hero. It's at moments like this that the public, still in shock from the horror of the tragedy that has just unfolded before them, can be led into the most ruthless despotism, despotism that now bears the mantle of security. Acts of terror and violence never benefit the average man or woman. They only ever benefit those in positions of power. This is why Nero fiddled while Rome burned. It gave him a chance to throw out the Christians to the lions and rebuild the capital of the Roman Empire in his own image. This is why Hearst and the warmongers of the emerging American Empire were delighted by the destruction of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor in 1898. It gave them the excuse they needed to rouse the public into supporting the Spanish-American War. This is why Israel attacked the USS Liberty in 1967 during the Six-Day War, strafing and torpedoing it relentlessly for hours in a vain attempt to send it to the bottom. The Israelis believed that the loss of the Liberty could be blamed on Egypt and draw the Americans into war. This is why there are hundreds of documented examples of government staging attacks in order to blame them on their political enemies. In every civilization, in every culture, in every historical period, authoritarians have known that spectacular acts of violence help to further consolidate their own power and control. 
And sadly, throughout history, there have been all too many willing to allow attacks to occur, to pretend that attacks have occurred, or even to attack their own population in order to further their political agenda. To think that such staged provocations and false flag attacks no longer occur would be as unrealistic as believing that human nature itself has changed, that powerful people no longer seek to increase their power, that influence is never used for deceit or manipulation, that lies are no longer told to satisfy greed or slake the thirst for control. It is to believe that our society is immune from those things that we have seen in every other society, in every other era. In short, it's a dangerous delusion. The people are once again learning the power of this delusion. They are learning the extent to which they have been lied to. They are once again studying their history. The Russians are learning how the FSB was caught planting bombs in Moscow in 1999 during a terror scare that swept Putin into power and stirred the public into supporting the Second Chechen War. They are learning how their autocratic ex-president came to power campaigning on the graves of those his old FSB cronies had killed. The Israelis are learning how Mossad has been caught time and again posing as the very Muslim terrorists they claim to be opposing. They are learning how Israel uses the specter of terror to further extend their blank check drawn on American funds to expand their police state at home and maintain their hardline stance, the world's sixth largest nuclear superpower supposedly threatened by the possibility that one of their neighbors may one day obtain a single nuclear weapon. The British are learning how their SAS officers were caught dressing up as Arabs in Iraq, driving around with trucks full of munitions, shooting at police to stir up ethnic tensions and ensure that permanent bases could be built in the region. They are learning how Haruna Swat, the supposed mastermind behind the 7-7 bombings, was working for British intelligence. They are learning how British military intelligence took part in IRA bombings. The Indians are learning how the Mumbai attack was helped by a U.S. agent who is cooperating with investigators so that he won't face questioning by foreign authorities. The Canadians are learning how their own provincial police dressed up as protesters in 2007 and threatened violence against other police in order to force a crackdown on peaceful protests. And the Americans. The Americans are learning that there were multiple bombs found, dismantled, and taken out of the Alfred P. Murrah building on April 19, 1995. They are learning that Timothy McVeigh had written a letter to his sister in which he claimed to be in the special forces for the U.S. Army. They are learning the bombing was being directed by FBI informants just as the 1993 World Trade Center bombing was. They are learning about 9-11 and the Gulf of Tonkin and Operation Northwoods and their own Army counterinsurgency manuals that teach officers how to commit false flag attacks to blame on their enemies. In short, the people are learning the truth. And now it is not just the militia that is being demonized by the establishment. It is veterans and gun owners, third-party supporters and libertarians, anti-war protesters and human rights campaigners, people who are upset with a government giving trillions to the banks that have engineered our current financial crisis. In short, everyone is now a potential terrorist according to the governmental and media agencies that deign to limit our range of acceptable opinion and control dissent. Even the word terrorist means something more than it did back in 1995, now after the false flag attack of 2001 allowed the passage of the Patriot Act, after the boogeyman of al Qaeda gave the NSA the opportunity to announce that they were collecting everyone's emails and everyone's telephone calls, after the former White House press secretary came out and admitted that the Bush administration had made up terror threats in order to scare the people into supporting the government, now we know what the real definition of terrorism is. It is governments scaring their own populations into line. But there is something else that's different now from what it was in 1995. The people are learning something else about terrorism. They are not terrorists for speaking out against their government. They are not terrorists for wanting the government to stop selling their children into servitude to pay bankers their bonuses. They are not terrorists for pointing out that the FBI and the CIA and Mossad and MI6 are behind every major international terrorist event. The people are not terrorists because they do not want to see more death. They do not want more destruction. The spilling of the blood of their fellow citizens is not in their interests. Death and destruction only ever serve the governmental and financial and industrial interests who always grow in power and wealth in the wake of every tragedy.
Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express. Ba 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 ba. We try a hide and destroy a freedom ma. You seek agenda. We know you know you anti American. You come pervert American Constitution. 1913 corrupt in the system. Diga you tell a hyperinflation. The Federal Reserve controlled by Lucifer. <laughs> See you lying